do now is um, you all are going to have a break. It's been a long day. Um, before I send you on break, we are going to hear from our good friend at CBEN, Amber Pearson Duncan, who is on our advisory board. We will ask that you come back by 4 p.m. so that you can hear um, our wonderful lightning round talks. Um, and then we will close the conference. So um, here we go, our advisory board member. And then see you all back here in 10 minutes exactly. I'm Amber Garrison Duncan. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Competency Based Education Network. CBEN is a network of uh, change makers who are leading a learning revolution. We believe that the way to, again, get to um, a place where learning is transparent and relevant to, to, to learners and to where they're seeking to take their learning, uh, that competencies must be the currency. And so uh, we structure everything in that way. So rather than using time-based measures of learning or other proxies, uh, we are actually looking at what does someone need to be able to know and do? How do we assess that learning? And then how do we allow individuals to make progress based on their ability to demonstrate those competencies, which in turn allows them a lot of flexibility in their program, also allows them to oftentimes to complete uh, in a quicker time frame than it would in a traditional time-based measure program. From my perspective, a couple of items. One is that that across the credentialing ecosystem, we all shift to being able to use a common language to explain and design learning and measure learning. And from, from my perspective, that would be, be competencies that as, if we're all using a, a more common way to, again, design learning, measure learning, then that would get us a long way in understanding how then learning translates across different contexts. Even if that's from one education provider to an employer or one education provider to another education provider, Individuals are increasingly needing to uh, leverage what they know and can do to further their education, to further their employment. And we have to be clearer about uh, and more transparent about what that is through the use of competencies. I've been a long time fan of the credential as you go model and of thinking about how it is that, again, individuals can modularize their learning and accumulate that over time. I think it's a much more realistic model to how people actually learn in the world. Um, we all are learning constantly as humans and being able to understand how different components of my learning add up to something is really important. And so the credentials you go model allows us to break that learning down, to structure that in ways that are meaningful to individuals and their pursuits. And then again, make sure that it actually continues to add up to to something meaningful for them, whether you want to measure that by economic mobility, you want to measure that by, again, career pursuits, but this is a much more, I guess, learner-friendly model, and again, more realistic for how people actually learn. All right, everyone, it's now 4 p.m. Uh, we are going to have you up. come on back if you were running around for your break. Uh, thank you so much for hanging in there with us. It's been a packed couple of days. Um, we hope you enjoy the sessions. We certainly have. We've learned so much. Um, but we're really excited about our next round of uh, lightning round talks, we're, we're calling them. So um, we are now be beginning our lightning round talks. Uh, these Short talks will highlight specific work across the Credentials You Go network within incremental credentialing. So we asked each presenter and our team to use one slide and take three to five minutes to showcase their work and provide key questions their work has addressed or that are still left unresolved. Um, please feel free to add any questions or thoughts that come up directly in the chat as our presenters are speaking and we'll provide a Q&A session at the completion of our six presentations where you'll be able to raise your hand and come off mute to ask questions directly of our presenters, or we can leave them out of chat for you. So I am now going to pass the mic to Jason Render to walk us through our lightning round. Jason. Great, thank you, Ashley. And hello, everyone. My name is Jason Render, as Ashley said. And for those of you who are not at our earlier sessions, I'm a policy associate at the Corporation for a Skilled Workforce, as well as serving as a project lead within the Credentials As You Go project. Um, so for our first lightning talk presentation, 
we will be hearing from Alana Barley, a Credential Pathways Coordinator with the Colorado Department of Education. Hi, everyone. Um, I don't know if you were going to, there, the slides are perfect. So um, one of the things that we are doing in Colorado is we're looking at creating a general education um, certificate or credential. Um, and it really came about with um, a case looking at um, the why, why would we do this? And we um, examined research and consistently the competencies gained in high demand and would not be automated, such as doing your general education courses. Your, um, we, we focus mainly on communication, both written and quantitative analysis and critical writing um, to one, give um, our, so students could articulate um, why they were taking general education, but also tie it to workforce. Um, and also, we also understand that having those successes really support student retention, persistence, that it will serve as an intermediate milestone to support that. And um, we're hoping it will also impact employment with the ability for them to articulate and with the completion of moving through. So um, some of the details is create a general education certificate that recognizes the, the completion of the general education degree requirements. And in Colorado, we actually have um, a GT pathways matrix of required content criteria and competencies that already exist with student learning outcome. So um, that's really the framework that we're utilizing. Um, and then within that, so once a student um, completes all the general education, they would receive that through. But we're also wanting to develop more incremental credentialing or micro credentials on the path to completing the general education. So really looking at the course and the competencies. So um, we really want to look at what is the added value, which we mentioned a few. We know consistently those are across the board um, skills that um, employers are seeking. And we also want to see the impact on learner incomes. As we mentioned again, will this actually support retention and those things? Um, so Things to consider is the why, what frameworks maybe already exist. Um, also, where we're at is the logistics of how will it be conferred um, and the naming. Do we want to call it general edu education or durable skills certificate um, and the development of micro and then data? We want to really definitely be looking at the data and um, what what would prove success. Um, so that's um, what we're doing in Colorado with general education and my contact is there and obviously open to any questions when the time arrives. Thanks. Jason, are you there? Jason, are you there? Amazing. I was having some <laughs> Zoom issues, people. My goodness, day two. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much, Atlanta. That was amazing. Um, for our next presentation, we will hear from Ashley Babcock, who is the founding dean of Continuing and Professional Education, CW Pro at the College of Westchester. Thanks so much. Hi, everybody. Uh, what we are doing at the College of Westchester is for this project, we are unpacking and stacking. We are focused on creating embedded credentials within the academic program as well as establishing a non-credit division of self-paced micro-credentials. So when I first started this project, I realized we had a lot of great embedded credentials. So we are already practicing embed as you go and specialize as you go, where we had like in our technology program, we had Network Plus, CompTIA Network Plus credentials or CompTIA Security Plus credentials. In our digital marketing, program, we had embedded Digital Marketing Institute and American Marketing Association credentials. So what I wanted to do is one, make sure we are recognizing and badging for that, but also start to unpack and pull out those credentials and create a non-credit division where we are having professionals who can upskill and reskill quickly come and do self-paced credentials. So to that end, we developed a process where we could unpack those credentials and really start to reimagine them for a completely asynchronous online self-paced experience. Uh, our three-step process is 
we first identified those embedded credentials. Uh, the example I have here is our dive into content marketing, which is also an industry credential um, with the Digital Marketing Institute. And then we kind of assess the length, delivery, method, and best package for the credential. Some of these were embedded in eight-week online classes. Some of them were embedded in eight-week hybrid classes. Some were in 16-week on-ground classes, right? So I would figure out the best delivery method for our asynchronous credential um, for our fully online non-credit division. And then we really had to create and market the new credentials or stacks of credentials. You'll see here on the side, I have a dive into content marketing credential. The black uh, around it represents it's a beginning credential. And then you see stacked the top of it is our deeper dive into content marketing. Both have DMI certifications attached to them. The second one has the silver outline and that is an intermediate credential. So we're starting to do that incremental and stacking credentials. Um, one of our burning questions is when building these credentials, should we ensure all stacks have that nice, neat, beginning, intermediate, advanced level of credential, or can we have more linear stacks, like three beginner credentials, or maybe one that has two beginner, one intermediate? So that's one of the things we're still playing around with. Two of the other questions and things that we're still kind of working through is the best process for deciding the moda modality. All of the ones that we have pulled out um, and put into our non-credit division are asynchronous online with some synchronous components that students can request. Uh, so we have this great guide on the side coaching sessions that students can request appointments to have one-on-one -on -one coaching. Um, but we haven't done any hybrid or on ground in CW Pro in our non-credit division. So it's one thing we're working through. And then really just what are some ways to create synergy in marketing strategies for both our non-credit and our four credit programs. If you have any more questions for me, um, the CW Pro team, that is our non-credit division. That's who's creating all of this. That is led by me. And our CW Pro email is on the slide. Thanks so much. Amazing. Thank you so much, Ashley. Thanks. Um, now I'd like to introduce our next presenter, Angela Westmoreland, who is an instructional design coach at Fayetteville Technical Community College. Now get the... Good afternoon, everyone. It is wonderful to be here today. Um, I've learned so much already. <laughs> um, just wanted to share very quickly how we are taking uh, generative AI and utilizing it and applying it for our program development. Our programs and incremental micro-credentials are um, somewhat new here um, at our institution. And so we are obviously building you know, from the ground up. I'm new to the actual program. Um, it was assigned to me or you know, I got involved a couple of uh, weeks ago. So one of the ideas that I had being a huge fan of tech and being a huge fan of the possibilities of AI um, is just to take some of their, um, the generative AI platforms, specifically chat GPT and um, use it to create some of our incremental credentials. And so what's really awesome about it, um, if you're familiar with uh, chat GPT at all or generative AI at all, is the conversational nature of the platform. So you can um, iterate and reiterate, ask it to um, edit its own, its own um, output which is really, really neat. And so my four faculty members that I've been working with were really kind of uh, blown away by the opportunity to apply the generative AI to the development of their, of their programs and their pathways. And what I like about it is it's um, the relevancy. I mean, it, it gives you some new ideas, it gives you some, gives you some new suggestions. And so um, with our incremental credentialing questions, you know, can it, how can it be used? With, you, with the right prompting, it can, um, with the right prompt language, it can come up with all kinds of ideas for you. We have utilized it to develop um, anything from new ways of assessing to rubrics to um, ideas for where to input those, those incremental credentials and what how they would assess mastery and um, 
demonstration and mastery by students and learners. And the benefits are obviously, I mean, it gives you some new ideas. Um, one of the challenges associated with it and the things to consider is that when you're using something like this, you know, every faculty member is not going to be familiar with it. And prompt language is certainly a skill um, similar to coding or any other uh, type of language that you may use. So there may need to be some additional training associated with the use of AI or generative AI or prompt language. Um, and also, um, it is the user's responsibility to ensure the accuracy um, and relevancy of the information. So, you know, it's not a, a one size fits, fits all all the time, but it does help to um, get started when you're staring at that blank screen. And also, like I said, gives you some new and fresh ways other than a, a, a paper and pencil test or a multiple choice assessment in Blackboard or whatever LMS you're perhaps using. And um, so it can be an effective tool and we have effectively used it to build the information that we're, we plan to move forward with. Thanks so much, Angela. It's uh, so cool to hear about AI, it's so ever evolving. Um, for our fourth presentation, we'll be hearing from Annette Carrico and Wendy Creasy from East Carolina University. Hi, everybody. I hope you're doing great. This has been a um, great conference so far, and we're so happy to be a part of it. Um, I'm Annette Carrico. I'm the Director for Continuing and Professional Education at East Carolina University for non-credit courses. And we are um, new to the game, and we're really excited to be creating a micro-credential program and digital badging program at ECU. Um, we have uh, approved three micro-credentials at this point and we have approved a digital badge as well. Um, our process has been um, first and foremost, a, a process of ensuring that we accept high quality proposals from faculty who want to engage in this area. Um, so we have assembled a wonderful multidisciplinary team um, with com a committee of faculty and leadership. Um, we created rules and proposed structure. Um, we invited faculty to propose micro-credentials for the program, and we went through a process of accepting those proposals um, by using a high-quality rubric to control what the information that came in, or not control it, but to, to ensure that the information that came in um, was a really high-quality um, proposal that would um, meet the needs of students and um, employers in our region. Um, we next moved on um, by asking those faculty members to develop those proposals and um, seek uh, support from the, their department and their deans to make sure that the programs are developed to meet the specific needs of these learners. Um, right now, we're, we're in a piloting process where we're piloting these wonderful programs um, that have been selected. Um, and it's really exciting. Um, our goal is to create exceptional programs which provide high demand skills for learners that are in our region that allow them to take these skills with them um, to upskill and um, to and to reskill workers where we are. Um, so first we have the 21st Century Leader Program, which was developed by our College of Business. Um, it is a program with eight um, eight modules, and after the eight modules are completed, they receive a micro-credential and business leadership. So that's a really exciting program that we're looking forward to and should be kicking off um, soon uh, this, this fall. Um, we also have two programs that are from our College of Education. One is Evidence-Based Observations for Equitable Academic Discourse for K-12 through Educators. Um, that is a program that is not only needed very much in our area um, for rural education, um, K through 12 educators and leaders, um, but it's also being, um, being requested um, from in California, New York, and Virginia, several other states that have been interested and have um, um, expressed interest in taking these micro-credentials. Um, our, our next Micro-credential is authentic community engagement for K through 12 educators, also from um, that same group um, and focused on rural educators in North Carolina. And our last um, our last proposal is our laboratory skills for um, laboratory skills for water resource students, um, which is a really important um, research area um, in our region. And these are digital badges for students who are working through a matrix of skills that will help them in future positions um, once they graduate from their program. Thank you so much. 
great. Thank you so much as well, Annette and Wendy as well. Thank you so much for the great work. And uh, we're going to be moving on to our fifth presentation right now. And we are joined by Kiko Suarez. And Kiko is an academic officer at Huntington Junior College. Thanks, Jason. Good to see you again. As a mind training innovation management, let me remind you that innovation is ripe in the spaces in between things. For example, in between processes, between programs, or between stages or phases. Transitions are perfect because you live in an in-between space for a while. A few years ago, our nonprofit umbrella organization working in civics education in the K-12 space acquired a civics education program that was doing great among incarcerated adult individuals in several states. You can find more at bendingbars.org. The program is based on four non-credit courses, ethics, civics, economics, and literature. Each week, inmates participate in two-hour in-person sessions using a Socratic-style discussion format. All that conditions allow in considering this is a maximum security prison, and sometimes you must deal with lockdowns and the like. About a year ago, the same nonprofit acquired the assets of an old accredited junior college in an economically distressed area at the core of the national opioid epidemic in West Virginia and hired a few of us to begin a profound transformation process. Who wants an easy challenge, right? Well, I love it. Not only did we need to engage the local population with this re-emerging inner city college, most of which may have gotten a GED many years ago, but we also adjusted our credit load from 108 quarter credits, way too many, to 90 quarter credits, which is the equivalent to 60 semester credits for across all AASs, based on the recommendation of the accrediting agency, the Higher Learning Commission. 108 was the result of adding general education requirements on top of core courses, rather than redesigning entire program. Who has time for those things, right? Well, this transition led to an innovation opportunity, and we inspired ourselves in our PRISM program, in the non-credit program, to create a four-credit civic certificate, all online for now, with the necessary rigor, quality, and contact hours of college-level courses that amounts to 16 quarter credits of general education that we already had in our college catalog. Courses will be ethics, personal growth and finance, U.S. history, and U.S. government. Available now in all degrees as an embedded certificate. Originally, our code name was G16, but we decided to call it a certificate. Uh, we offer students to switch from the old to the new catalog, and many saw the benefit, of course, from going from 108 to 90 credits. But employers really applauded the effort of having something to show in the civic engagement area above and beyond you know, being really great at whatever you're doing, dental assisting or being an accountant. I can certainly assure you it was, it was a lot of work, but it was definitely worth it. So let me leave you with one final thought about innovation. Innovation is not about new things. It's about better ways to deliver value. And I'll repeat that one, better ways to deliver value. At times, it can be done by simply recombining your own DNA. Our DNA was civics education. And now our college has a 16 quarter credit connector across all programs. And what's even more fascinating is that we are now closing this virtual circle by requesting approval for a prison education program so we can offer college level education in prison. So open to questions later. Thanks for inviting me. Amazing. Thank you so much, Kiko, and for sharing such transformational work that you all are doing. Um, so going into our final presentation, we will now be hearing from Kelvin Bentley, who is a program manager within the Texas Credentials for the Future at the University of Texas System. Unfortunately, Kelvin wasn't able to join us today as he's currently participating in our cross-state meeting, which is happening at this exact time, um, but he's recorded a presentation which we'll be sharing at this time. Hi, everyone. My name is Kelvin Bentley. I serve as the program manager for Texas Credentials for the Future. It's an exciting initiative within the University of Texas system, which is a nine campus system 
uh, the project in part is designed to basically improve the career readiness of our uh, students and alumni as they make that transition from university to the world of work. And the way in which we're doing that is providing free access to industry recognized credentials through our partner uh, Coursera, such that the combination of the undergraduate degree, in addition to the technical skills assigned with a high demand entry level positions, we hope will make our students and alumni even that much more successful, especially those college majors where we know by looking at labor market data, as well as data that we're collecting about our alumni, where you know students are not making as much money post-graduation compared to their peers. And so we really want to find a way to provide our students and alumni access to technical skills that they can then combine with their liberal arts education to be successful in the world of work. This project has actually been, uh, you know, it originally started in, in our state uh, back in 2020. We actually received Strata Education Foundation funding from their Beyond Completion Challenge grant starting in 2021, where we we're able to kind of do some initial piloting of uh, embedding micro-credentials, as well as making them available to students co-curricularly. And now we are one of four institutions that were selected by Strata to actually scale our work. And so our hope is that we will you know, be able to impact at least 30,000 students. And, uh, and our hope is that we will be able to positively impact 22,000 students of, of color because those, those earning disparities are actually worse for that subgroup. And the work that we've been doing, I would say, a big, uh, uh, you know, receiving support from the grant has been helpful because we've been able to provide incentives to our faculty to engage in micro-credentialing work and also bigger conversations around policies and procedures to support the work. But I would say a, a big contributor also has just been our system. We have a very supportive chancellor and, and the Board of Regents who provided us additional funding for example, to provide access to the professional certificates within Career Academy on the Coursera platform, which again allows us to make that available to all students, all alumni for free, at least over the next two years. And I think another thing that's just helped us is that we've been able to engage with a lot of different stakeholders. So when you're doing these types of projects, especially around micro-credentialing, it's definitely important to provide professional development opportunities for your faculty and staff, so that they feel supported and they can learn more about this uh, ever, ever growing, ever, ever changing ecosystem called micro-credentials. And so providing that support, and we'll also be providing additional prof uh, professional development opportunities as well uh, on, on topics like credit for prior learning. But some of our initial professional development has been on workshops. We have vendor partners like WorkCred that actually helped us to develop a system-wide online course that uh, faculty and staff have been completing this summer as well as the previous summer. And then we're going to make a self-paced version of that course available such that any faculty member, any staff member can learn more about the micro-credentialing work that we're doing as a system, but also just in general in terms of the ecosystem. I really feel that Credential As You Go really opens up even more opportunities for our system to learn from the greater ecosystem of people interested in providing alternative pathways, uh, new pathways for students to help them not just be successful as they uh, you know, take on college, but also be successful in the world of work. We really want to engage with folks that we can learn from as well as share ideas with to help improve and inform this space. And we also are very interested in learning more about, you know, how can micro-credentials be stackable in ways that help students accelerate their progress toward graduation. And so as a system, I think we can learn a lot from our fellow consortium uh, members within Credential As You Go. And uh, the resources that I have seen on their website are very, uh, are varied and many. And uh, just looking forward to 
our faculty and staff across our nine academic campuses, especially digging into those resources to help inform the work that they're doing in support of our, uh, again, our system-wide micro-credentialing efforts. Okay, so at this point, thank you all to the presenters. We wanted to, to get some questions from you all. So you've heard all six presentations. Um, hopefully they were inspiring with what they've uh, created, what they are creating. Um, are there any questions out there for any of the well, five presenters? We can't ask Kelvin yet until he comes back into the room. He's in the state system meeting at this moment. Um, anyone have anything that they would like to ask? Okay, um, Annette, I'm seeing your question in the chat. Are there any playbooks for employers? And so we have actually, as a group, talked about um, playbooks for different audiences. Um, one area we would like to move into in the future is thinking about uh, different stakeholders, different perspectives, and how they might interact with incremental credentials. So of course, um, employers is an area that we need to move into, right? I mean, we need employers to understand what incremental credentials mean. We need, we need that common language. We need to know that there was um, some want to use those incremental credentials in the hiring process, identifying skills, things like that. And so um, that is an area that we are hoping to um, expand into a little bit more to help our understanding in that area. And I can definitely bring back the idea of a playbook to the leadership team. And same goes for learners, yeah different perspectives. Thank you so kindly. Um, I was interested, uh, particularly if if um, taking in students who are have been had an issue with incarceration and if there would be questionable background checks and how employers respond to that. And the reason I ask that is I run a community health worker program at our university. And in order to pass our Ohio Board of Nursing um, certification process, there needs to be a clean background check of sorts. Now, I tend to get these background checks. I look at them, and some of it is very, very old. And then I offer the students expungement clinics and then did um, get a recommendation from the um, Ohio Board of Nursing, who oversights community health worker programs in addition to the nursing programs, that uh, students can very often write a paragraph of what happened and then still get certified. But has anyone else had experiences um, with um, the questionable background check and how that might be a disparity for those moving forward? Many times, unfortunately. And I don't have any words of wisdom other than it varies by state, varies by profession. Um, even universities that claim to be um, open to this conversation had um, very rigorous admission processes. You can't even establish articulation agreements and things like that. So mm -hmm. it's a it's a very unfortunate place to be. I I don't I don't have any answer for you, John, mm -hmm. other than you know, yeah. God bless you. <laughs> yeah. Oh well. Yeah. You know, I've had some of um, our students, at least two, who had felonies that were reduced to misdemeanors, and one particular student who did jail time. Many of them come out of the human sexual trafficking industry and have been forced to break the law by the whoever's in charge of them, I guess. And so um, it generally by doing the um, paragraph, um, if they can't get an expungement, that they, there has been some leniency where that's concerned. So thank you. Yeah, thank you both for that. Any other questions? I have one for Annette, if, while you're all thinking. Annette, I, I think Wendy hopped off, but Annette's still here, so I'm gonna pick on you. <laughs> um, Annette, I know ECU has done a lot of really thoughtful work in planning policy and process and getting everything, kind of all your ducks in a row uh, before really jumping feet first into implementing. And I think that's an important um, thing for a lot of institutions to understand because not all institutions are able to do that, right? So. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your first steps, things that maybe you, looking back, would have realized you did first, um, some words of advice to other institutions who are just starting out. Sure. I think that's a really important question because we have, in many cases, taken two steps forward and three steps back. 
Um, but I think that one of the key things that we did was assemble that team of folks in leadership and key people around the university, um, as well as faculty, because we wanted to make sure that the faculty really understood the intention of the micro-credentialing program and bought into the idea so that they could be champions and spread that word through faculty about um about the, the true nature of what this program would be and why. Um, we also um, saw those key people in continuing education, in career services, um, even our, our marketing and creative services folks, so that we could get everybody on board and really kind of think about how we would roll out what this information would be so that there would be a very clear message once we really start implementing all of the programs. Um, the, the message would be clear, what's happening, why are we doing it, and how can you be involved? Um, so those those are some of the key things that I think that we've done really well. Um, and, you know, some of the hard things is that, as you know, um, as, as we've talked about, as we uh, look at all these different pieces, um, we we plan something, we ask a question, and we think that we have everything answered. And then somebody, you know, sees it through a different lens and asks us a question where we think, hmm, well, we thought it was crystal clear. But now that you've asked this question, we realize we need to tweak this a little bit. Um, so those are some of the things that are challenges within the process, and I would just encourage anyone who's new um, to the process to be open to those challenges and, and know that you're going to take steps forward and then have to move back and then move forward again um, as you go through the process, because that has been our experience. But it's been a wonderful experience, and we're really excited now that we have the first couple of programs that are, um, that are moving forward, and we're looking forward to many more. Great, thank you so much. Could we have a few more minutes if anyone else has any other questions for any of the presenters? I think, oh, Joan, go right ahead, jump right back in. I'm sorry, I, I do have another question. Yeah. You know, what came to mind is um, the um, faculty and with the embedded um, credentials into the um, regular um, credit bearing areas. How does that work in terms of workload for any of you who have done it? Um, how does that even out with if they're going to be teaching a certification course that's embedded uh, in term in in a degree bearing um, area? So I can jump in how yeah. how we do it. Um, so the embedded credentials are usually within the workload of the class they're teaching. Um, but then if they're doing one of the stackable credentials that we pulled out that's non-credit, um, I do a stipend for them and we uh, put how many hours it will be. So that way we're tracking to make sure adjuncts don't go over for New York State, it's 28 hours a week. So that's what we're tracking. And then for full time, we're just tracking to make sure that the load's sustainable and, you know, that we're not giving somebody who really wants to do this, you know, an extra 12, 15 hours a week if they're already teaching a full load. So, mm -hmm. but we are very mindful of that. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Ashley. Thanks, Joan. Okay, and I do see a question in the chat. Uh, Sarah is asking, what have folks who offer credentials outside of four credit courses found works with admissions or other onboarding staff? How do you support, monitor, et cetera, learn learners? Maybe this was discussed earlier sessions, but I may have missed it. So, and I wanna jump in on that. What are, how are you offering um, credentials outside of four credit courses? Or any are you or the ones that are embedded? I know Doreen is embedding a couple of credentials into our courses. Um, and the others on the call that have been doing some of that work and how you deal with admitting students and getting students in those. Uh, in, in my case, we we just use um, college credit courses. So we basically simplified our life by creating micro credentials that are college courses that we already offer as part of a program. When we go out and offer those micro credentials, the instructors don't care where you're coming from; they teach you that course. So it's I mean it was a lot easier for us for so many reasons, including financial aid and the whole nine yards. <laughs> Very much so. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. 
And Ashley, we also started that way. But as I shared during my breakout, the other piece that we have is that there are about six of our micro credentials where there are certifications embedded in the courses. And so that is something that faculty decided upon and that it's industry recognized, but it's also a requirement. So something so simple as a CERF-SAFE certification in all of the culinary micros makes sense because it's an industry standard. Um, but our professors are certified to give them the um, certification. So it's embedded at no additional cost to the student. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Doreen. We, we have created a medical billing micro-credential that has our imprimatur. So the college offers the micro-credential, but it, what it truly does is prepares the students for an industry certification. So they will get our micro-credential as a specialist in medical billing, and then they will be prepared to pass a test of the corresponding trade association, which would also give them a second uh, industry yeah. certification by doing that. So that's a great point. And even without the certification, you know, they may be able to do some sort of entry level position in a medical office until they obtain the certification, but it gives them experience and it gives them a way to move up in that organization, which is great. Great point. Okay, and Elena, you want to jump in? Yeah, I just wanted to share a resource in Colorado, um, Metropolitan State University, Denver offers um, Career Launchpad, and they've done a lot of great work doing non-credit for credit. So I'm happy to put um, the connection to MSU. I'm sure they'd be happy to, to answer questions or look on their website. They have a, um, they're a great model for that, um, if that would be helpful, Sarah. Yeah, that's great. And actually, Terry Bauer did a presentation yesterday on Career Launchpad. Perfect. So we'll be following up with um, the recording of that session, some information on how to reach her, things like that. So thank you so much, Alana. Um, okay, at this point, any last uh, other last questions? We do have um, one, uh, Kelvin mentioned WorkPred. And so we do have one more advisory board uh, video and it was a perfect transition from Kelvin and he didn't even know it. Um, and then we're going to come right back and I'm going to, our state system folks are back in the room. So I'm going to pass it back to Holly Zanbell and Melissa Goldberg um, at the conclusion of the video. So sit tight one moment. Roy Swift. I'm the executive director of WorkRed. It's an affiliate of the American National Standards Institute. And WorkRed is designed to look at the quality, market value, and effectiveness of workforce credentials by conducting research, consulting, and conducting educational activities. WorkRed feels that the most important issue facing the U.S. credentialing system is the lack of third-party data related to non-degree credentials. We feel we need to build the infrastructure and systems to collect and use data, change the culture of the non-degree credentialing organizations to collect data, and link that administrative data uh, to the understanding of the value, effectiveness, economic mobility, and labor market outcomes, and use that data to develop policy and create a national research agenda about the non-degree credentials and credential holders. We think it's an important initiative because, frankly, we think the sum is greater than its parts. Too often the credentials in this country are uh, isolated pillars and credential as you go is trying to look at the total system and frankly, the, how we best integrate different types of credentials for successful pathways. Okay, with that, I wanted to thank the lightning round uh, presenters. It was really great to get a peek into your work. We look forward to catching up with you some more in the future. Um, as of right now, I'm going to pass it back to Holly Zanville and Melissa Goldberg.
Thanks so much. Uh, this is Holly. I'm not sure my camera's working. <laughs> this could be evidence that six hours is too much <laughs> for my camera on my computer. But and, and Melissa is going to take us home in just a minute or so. But we wanted to ask, many of you were here yesterday, but some of you were not. And we have one last ask of you all. And that is if you would put into the chat one or two of the things that have been most helpful to you that you you know you picked up at the conference or two, one or two uh, takeaways. We'll just give you a minute or so to jot some things in. And then Melissa literally is going to take us home. Yes. Yeah. Um, oh, Jacob was so intrigued by uh, Florida's um, uh, uh, set up with employer employee partners to guarantee interviews with specific badge earners. Yeah, that's great. Embedding certifications and credit bearing courses. This is great. Keep them coming. We are recording, you know, um, making sure that we're keeping um, track of all of this information. So we appreciate your sharing those. Um, at this stage, I think we want to adjourn with a huge thank you to everyone that put together breakout sessions and lightning rounds to the board members who prepared their video messages, to our funders, and frankly, to all of you for the amazing work that you're doing um, to transform our post-secondary system uh, to uh, in America to, to one that works better for all Americans. Um, the other thing um, that we I just don't want to leave without thanking like our fantastic team who um, organized the conference and put everything together. And that includes um, Ashley Frank, Lisa Weathers, um, uh, Jason Render, um, Stephanie Bailey, um, and my notes are gone, um, and, and Molly Katzenberg. And did I leave anybody out? team? Nope. And Diamond. And oh my goodness, and Diamond <laughs> Williams. Yeah. Thank you all so much. And at this point, I just want to thank you again for your active participation, for all of your um, great comments. And um, we look forward to seeing you at upcoming um, affinity group meetings and um, large group net network meetings. And um, sending out all of the information um, that we pulled together from this conference. So thanks again. And at this point, we'll adjourn.